Yeah, I was super pumped about today's episode. Today was going to be uh, all about chiropractic. We, yeah. we, we, we took a trip down to San Diego. Um, well, I've been I've been using chiropractic for like 28 years now. I mean, since since 15. Uh, had my kids adjusted, all that. Uh, so I thought it was really cool. Took you down to San Diego uh, to get adjusted by my brother after you did a yoga session for him. Awesome stuff. We had so many cool conversations over there outside of that too, which are going to be for later episodes. And then yesterday we went to go look at the episodes and they weren't on my computer. Um, so, but no big deal. <laughs> so so I, so, no, no, right no, 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 no. So I checked, so I checked, I checked my one computer. I'm like, well, you know, it's not on there. So I checked my other computer. I'm like, oh shit, it's not on there either. And then I check uh, Dropbox. I remember we sent some stuff to Dropbox, but yeah. then I thought I told you, no, it didn't go through. Uh, and then I checked my other hard drives too. I'm like, oh, I don't have it. And then you checked it yesterday while I was doing a little bit of yoga and uh, it told me that they weren't there on your hard drive. Yes, I did. And I was like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> I was so like, we were know? panicking. We, so, we... Well, we both were like, oh, yeah, you thought that I had said we didn't need them because like, they had gone on Dropbox or whatever, and so that's why you deleted them. You didn't really remember deleting them, yeah. but you figured you must have, and it must have been then. And I don't really remember what I had said, you know, because it was late at night and whatever else. Um, so, you know, all that footage of my brother and, uh, and uh, going down to Tenth Planet and our talk with Boogie and Jake over at the arena, and I was like, ah, oh, man, that was a lot of stuff. But yesterday you said... While doing yoga, um, oh, you know what? I need to get adjusted, and we could just go back down there. And we had planned on that anyhow, and like, yeah, you know, we'll just make it better. We did end up finding. It. We did. Yeah, we we, we so we, we found it today because uh, Anthony <laughs> checked yesterday, but he forgot that I had rearranged his stuff so it actually made sense. And so when I plugged in, I was like, oh, there, it's all right there. So we found it. We found it. We so found all the footage was there, but I I would already. Um, I had been thinking about it since yesterday. I was like, you know what? Why don't we just talk about it? Because this already happened, you know, before. Uh, with unlocking the cage, dude, yeah. it felt terrible. It, I, I, I was I was pretty upset when it happened, you know, blaming myself. Um, but we lost uh, probably like 40 interviews, maybe more. Wow. So, I'm like, okay, maybe that's only 10% of the interviews. But it's like, just the fact that I lost any. Some of them, I had, luckily, my friend had already been able to edit. Um, and so I at least had the edited version, but then there were certain ones like, dude, I, I was at Josh Koscheck's house like all day and had an awesome interview with him, and uh, that footage was lost. I never got to watch it again. Oh. So you know that was kind of upsetting, um, but you, I just I had to accept it then, and just I, I realized you know it's part of the learning curve. Um, it's a big thing, yeah. Yeah, I mean, me and you could have blamed each other and fought about it and bickered about it, but. It was pretty simple. We were like, okay, if it is gone, then we do need to go back down there. It's not a big deal, and we'll, we'll make it happen. So that was cool. You yeah, know, it wasn't a big no, deal. I, I think, didn't I argue think, or bicker. I, th I think that's I think that's important. Um, and with the learning curve, any anything anything that we're going to start has a learning curve. With unlocking the cage, I had, it, it's almost why I didn't. I almost didn't start the project. I had to have so many friends tell me just to do it and to encourage me and my wife and everyone else. But I, I had never held a camera. Like I, I had never taken <clears throat> photos before. I didn't know how to uh, conduct an interview. I'd never interviewed anyone before. Um, I didn't know what I was, and then on top of that, I'd never, you know, it'd been so long since I had trained and I was in terrible shape. So there was a giant learning curve. Um, during episode uh, interview with uh, Joe Lozon, uh, I was pumped to interview him at the end of the night. I'd already interviewed the rest of his, like five or six of the guys on his team. And then three minutes in, my camera stops and the memory card was full. And, yeah, and right, I had no right, idea. Right. I had no idea what it was, you know. And he's like, oh, he's like, you don't have a backup? And he's like, and then he told me, he's like, hey, make sure you're always, because he's a computer guy. Uh, and he told me, he's like, man, he's like, make sure you always have backups with everything. He's like, because what happens if your stuff gets lost? And so you want at least two copies. And so thank you, Joe. I appreciate those words of wisdom. Yeah. I still lost 40 uh, interviews <laughs> after that. Uh, so, But we're, it's the learning curve. Yeah, right? yeah, we're, it's the uh, learning curve. But... We, we started it, so that's that's the important. Thing. And with this, dude, we don't know what we're doing. Like what podcast? No, like it's... how many times did we 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 tried filming the first episode a couple times, and yeah. the sound was terrible. And um, like, so hopefully now the sound is better. better. I, I think it is. The lighting should be better. Um, you know, we're just learning as we go because if we wait until we feel comfortable and feel confident. It won't ever happen. Probably when it was started. No. Because we don't feel comfortable, confident uh, now. So right. it's just, you know. Oh, I do. Um, 
I'm awesome. I don't know what's going on um, right now. So, but you know, I think that's I think that's important to realize, and just what that that holds people back a lot of the time. Uh, just says yeah. So you just have to be okay with like, no, I'm not an expert. I'm like, we're doing this. We, we think we have a a good message. We're having fun. Uh, I enjoy doing it. So we'll continue to do it, and we'll continue to get a little bit better. Yeah, and uh, that's for sure. And that's it. But yeah, what you said about us, we could have both been pretty upset with each other. Um, you know, you could have blamed it on me. I could have blamed it on you. Uh, but it would not have changed the situation, you know. And I think no. I used to always, uh, dude. I mean, I was negative all the time. But especially if something like this had happened, like I would have been pissed and I wouldn't have let it go and it would have bothered me and whatever else. But I was like, no. I was like, it's, it's just another opportunity. It's whatever the situation is. Like that's what you deal with. It doesn't yeah. matter. So, I mean, really, like. Everything from our past doesn't matter. Like even even you uh, in the war, or you and your injuries, or, or whatever else, it's like it doesn't matter. That's just where yeah. you're at right now. Yeah. It doesn't matter that those things happened. It's just like well, no, it's a good what, point. Yeah, what are you doing from this it's moment? It's a good like, point. All that matters is this moment. And it's funny you bring it up because like I think that's where I learned how to just live in the moment. It wasn't the service because I could bitch and complain all I wanted, but yeah. nothing was going to change where I was at or where I was going to be stationed or where I had to be in a month or so. Um, it didn't matter if it was my girlfriend's birthday or, or, or my mom's funeral. It's like, you got to be somewhere. Mm-hmm. You got to go do something. So deal with that first and then everything else comes yeah. later. So yeah, no, that's a good point. Well, Did that sound like my mom died? I was just being like throwing out. <laughs> so <laughs> just to clarify, just to clarify, my mother is well and alive. I just thought of that horrible example. I just meant some some big occasion. <laughs> I, I I got it, but yeah, okay. that, that, that's good to put out there. Um, wow. You know, one of the things, uh, yeah, because situations aren't always going to be perfect. Um, I'd say overall, in my life, like I'm going to be happy. I'm I'm happy every day because overall, everything's awesome. But like one thing that was kind of bugging me was uh, wasn't able to train. I didn't think about when I got my tattoo. I didn't think about how long I was gonna not be able to train because of it. I was like, oh, it's a little tattoo on my calf. Like no yeah. big deal. I'll be able to roll probably pretty soon, and definitely could do yoga. Like I'll do yoga hard the next day. And then I realized, no, can't do that because I can't stretch it. I'm gonna, if I stretch it, it's gonna get all jacked up and. Start to uh, crack. And yeah, yeah. So, and, and you helped me realize that, but it's still been tough, you know. So, and then I made the mistake of trying to roll on Saturday, really light. Uh, I I wore my spats, and Hold under on, that, really I, quick. I, yeah. After he had asked me, oh yeah, we I spoke asked about. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, and John said the same thing. I shouldn't have done it, um, but I'm not always the smartest guy, and I don't. But that's how was, fun rolling is, though. Yeah, and, like, and you're willing to almost. Not yeah, ruin a tattoo. Ruin a tattoo. Not, like kind of risk not it. Not really, like, but like I know my, parts of it yeah. because it's so fun to roll. And, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I knew, I knew. I was like, well, I might jack up the color a little bit, um, but then he'll just touch it up. So <laughs> that's yeah, how fun rolling is. Yeah, yeah. that's how fun it is. Yeah, that's um, awesome. So, but yeah, so I had a hard time with that, and uh, and, and Libby, uh, my my daughter, she had a hard time not being able to train for a little bit too because she got stitches on uh, when she yeah, was doing a five k. Her mom had told her the night before that uh-huh. she didn't want her to do it. Jen didn't know why. She just like she was pretty adamant about it. Like she really didn't want Libby doing it because she hadn't been feeling that well, and uh, she shouldn't be out running if um, she's not feeling well. I was like, well, she's rolling. I was like, rolling's a lot harder than running. I was like, what's the big deal? If she goes and runs. But we should have listened to Jen because uh, around the first little corner of this 5K, like maybe 50 yards, and she uh, trips on a bench and lands and hits her head open. Uh, hits her head on on the corner of the yeah. bench and gets like there's only two little stitches um you know but not being able to train for her was, was tough she wants to be on on yeah on the she, mat. and we have to limit her like uh during drills and whatnot we have to look around and see what who we're matching the kids up with and poor Livy's in the corner on on, on the wall and we're like sorry sweetheart yeah. uh we'll do the next one yeah. go shrimp go do some yeah. shrimps like you know because she can't uh but yeah, because I was watching her um, even just it was last week and she was doing a drill with her cousin Bailey. Yeah, and oh, trying to get out of just trying to get out a rubber guard. And Bailey had a nice rubber guard. She just started training, but because she's so flexible and strong, but the heads are right. There. Yeah, and their heads are close together and they're getting picked up. And I'm just like, um, probably shouldn't be doing that either. And but, Livy goes for it. Yeah, she doesn't not ever like you know. So yeah, 
So that was a that that's something we've been dealing with, but it's cool. I, I'm able to tell her, you know, like, yeah, look, I can't do this either. I'm also one thing that sucks. I haven't been able to go in the sauna for I I use the infrared sauna mm-hmm. usually twice a day, and that's helped out so much. Uh, so by not doing the sauna and by not doing yoga, I mean I should have been doing some light stretching at home, but um, yeah, I, I've definitely taken a step back. But today I came in, um, you weren't in. So I just did uh, my own thing for like an hour and just long stretches that I need because like my body feels it from uh, not doing anything for like a whole week. For sure, so. for sure. So you might have heard Mark talking about his cute little tattoo and how he can't train. And it prompted me to talk about something that's really important to the jiu-jitsu community and to my heart. And there's no easy way to say it. I'm just going to... What do you do when your training partner is a bitch? Um, it's rough. It could be rough out there. I think the first and important step is to realize that, in fact, yes, it's true. He is. She is. Doesn't matter. The word doesn't matter. We're not talking about a woman, a man. Doesn't matter. We all get what's going on here. First step. Take advantage of that partner. Let them know you are the dominant species on this planet and you will prevail. Second of all, just ditch them. Ditch them, get stronger, come back and dominate them some more. Let them know that through getting silly tattoos on their body, it's gonna cost them dearly. So friends, just a few tips. And if you have a problem that I'm having, I get it, guys. It's hard out there. Jiu-Jitsu isn't easy. But really, Mark, a tattoo? Really? That's all I got for you guys today. See you next time. Uh, back to our usual scheduled broadcasting. Yeah, so I'm back. Um, next week's episode is going to be about attacking people's right calves when they're just like a little sissy on that side. Maybe it maybe it was a that, that was a cool little thing that we learned from my brother, right? We, we, we found out that your calf was oh. a little bit smaller than uh, <laughs> your right calf is a little bit smaller wow. than your left um, for whatever reason. And then we just we just happened to discover. You know, I'm going to pull a Nate Diaz right now. <laughs> and I'm going to take the mic off. We, we discovered like, so if you are rolling with Anthony, you might just want to go for like even a straight ankle lock on, on, on his right calf. Um, I'm going to get a, yeah. That's a good a one because Diaz there. just did that in the, in the press conference. Oh, did yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're fucking, That's we're good. on it. Yeah, on it. Speaking of on it, I had my alpha brain today and my vitamins last night. Yeah, I do the primal care. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, this isn't going to be a commercial for on it. Not sponsored by them yet. Yet. Throw me some pills on it and I'll try it. I love it. Oh, I dude, just can't no, afford I, it. Yeah. That's <laughs> the beauty of it. And a nice rhyme too. Okay, so, all right, let's talk about this. Let's talk about, all right, so it's been awesome seeing Olivia train. Maybe maybe you could, uh, what you were mentioning to me earlier about what you what changes have you seen in her? Um, as far as just even interaction, interacting with oh, you Olivia, or, or yeah. just, yeah. Well, no, um, before when I would just come to the house and do yoga, we'd go down to our dungeon, our basement and do yoga. And I'd see her passing, and she was always a shy kind of girl, and just a little smile, maybe a little mm-hmm. hand, but that's it. Um, but now being around her a little, you know, more, and being her coach or her assistant coach, <clears throat> just her. First of all, actually looking at me and like smiling at me and acknowledging that I'm coming through or walking by, yeah. that's pretty cool. And then, uh, you know, all the little girls like to do cartwheels and stuff before, or, you know, before class. Mm-hmm. And so her, for her to say you know, coach, look, or, you know, ask me to look at something she's doing. That's cool. Um, and then just overall seeing her on the mat and how she interacts with all the other kids. Um, like she, I wouldn't think that she's a, if I saw her sh- solely on the mat, I wouldn't think that she was a shy girl because mm-hmm. she's just like willing to participate. She wants to do drills. She does. She's not like scared or intimidated by who, which, who she's going to go with. Mm-hmm. She just, it's fun. And then no matter how hard the drilling gets, or if they're rolling, like they're laughing, and like she gets taken down, she laughs and tries to pull rubber guard. Or um, so if I would have just seen her on the mats, I would never think that she was a shy girl mm-hmm. or anything like that. But knowing her for about a year and some change now, um, at least with me, 
I'm not sure if it's the whole assistant coach thing or the center, but or just you know more spending more time around mm-hmm. me. But she's I can see her blossoming already yeah. just a little bit more. So just on a small small tip in my yeah. angle, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that's I think it's awesome. I am mean, so happy that I put her. And it, again, it doesn't have to be jujitsu. It could be any martial art, or it could be anything with good instructors. It could be any sport. Um, but I wasn't sure about how I felt, uh, you know, her doing her doing martial arts. Um, but That's... it was when I so when I went around the country, I was looking at uh, classes, and I was talking to parents, I was talking to kids. I was like, hundred percent, it's a good thing if you have a good instructor. And I have some family members who are reluctant to put their kids into martial arts or jujitsu because a they're going to get hurt. Mm-hmm. B I have some nieces that are feisty and they might think it might bring out some more anger or or some or teach them some some bad habits uh what do you say about uh, like that, the parents that are hesitant you know yeah about, no that was that was exactly my concern um i don't want her doing something where she's gonna get hurt uh when i went to 10th planet burbank uh kim i believe it was kim that leads the class there uh they had just an incredible class a great teacher and then i interviewed her and she was telling me all the stats on the injury rate like in soccer and cheerleading and baseball and all these sports compared to jiu-jitsu and martial arts Mm -hmm. it's ridiculous like martial arts are safe in comparison uh yeah you might get hurt i mean i've had injuries i've hurt my i've hurt quite a few things but for everything i've done you know i've been very fortunate um you know i had worse injuries in football so i think the whole dangerous and you're gonna get hurt eh, no um, I do understand the idea that if you're teaching someone how to fight and they're already aggressive, that maybe they might use it the wrong way. I, I understand that fear, but that is not what we see. And especially if they, you know, it comes back to a great instructor. And also, what kind of parent are you? You know, what what are you teaching your kids? Are you teaching them to fight? Like, mm-hmm. do you handle a problem if someone says something to you? Do you have to, you know, handle it right there? You know, so that's big it, for so, you to so, say. So, you so it comes to uh, both of those things. Um, and you know, it was going around, going around the country, talking with coaches. One of the really, uh, it, I'm actually writing about it right now. Chapter 17 is um, one of the chapters I talk about going to New Mexico. Yeah, because uh, I got to go to New Mexico, interview a lot of fighters. Um, one of the first things I did was go to Wink's gym. Mike Winklejohn and his wife Heather have a gym. Um, besides the famous Jackson Winklejohns, um, and really cool gym uh family gym got to train with him there um i had the chance to watch him teaching the kids class Mm -hmm. and it was just awesome and then afterwards i when i interviewed him we we did talk about the kids class and you know why why does he even why is he even bothering you know he's a master striker uh john jones holly holm all those guys you know he that's 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 his job but then he goes and he teaches little kids you know a lot of people would think oh who wants to do that but he's explained no he's he's giving back and what he's he sees what he's giving these kids here's uh mike winkle john uh talking a little bit about that well first off any martial art is definitely beneficial to kids there's no doubt it builds their confidence and, and, and the physical skills and all that's great um what i believe in though is the actual application of what we're doing and that's where a lot of martial art systems the way they're taught traditionally um leave leave a lot to be said they don't actually grab each other. And, and so the people, they, they're doing cotters and they're doing forms, they're doing things in the air, but when someone throws a punch, they never had that happen before. So we try to apply it as much as we can in a controlled situation. And, and it, instead of just a self, self-confidence, it becomes true confidence. It, it's, they actually know they can do these things. And, and it plays out. I notice it, it plays out right away. The kids start uh, tussling with each other right away. They're, they're, they're pulling the kid's head down. They're shooking them down. Whatever the case is, they're fitting in a gi team. They know that. Whereas most kids that do a lot of martial arts, when those confrontations happen, they might drop into a stance. And now they're limited to what they can do. Um, they've never really been in that situation before. Um, with my stepdaughter, Autumn, she loves it. And what I've noticed with her is, she has real limited function on one side of her body, especially her arm. Her legs pretty much caught up. A lot of ha- that has to do, of course, with my wife and the therapies she's done with her. But by only having use of one arm, she, we've had to modify things for her and, 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 and have her adapt, and she's learned. And I think that's gonna play out later on in life. She's learning how to finish a double leg when she can't really tap that knee. Um, she learns how to have to use her balance in different ways. Um, it might sound complicated, but I believe that that's going to play out in life because she'll look for solutions on her own because she has to find solutions on the mat. And uh, 
the confidence that built is built, the friendship that's built, and then over and above that, she's learning to help others. And I think that's the key. I mean, that's this part of human nature. It sounds like you're teaching them to fight, like you're teaching them to beat, beat each other up. But you know what? You give them a choke, and they tap, and you let go. How compassionate is that? I mean, that, that's so cool. You know, it, it's not about fighting. It's, it's about playing. It's, it's, it's just, it's play. It's having fun. I think it's something that uh, I highly recommend to all kids. I, I think they need to do it. I think that kids, as they grow up, if they're always bullied, if they're scared of physical confrontation, they're going to feel bad about themselves. I think they won't be as strong in the business world. They won't be as strong in life. They won't be as strong in their relationships. I also think it plays out the other way. You have kids that are overly aggressive, feel like they have something to prove. Now, you know what? They can prove it in the gym. And I've noticed, I've taught martial arts for 30 years, the kids that get really good at what they're doing never get in street conflicts. They don't have to, they don't feel the need to, they carry themselves differently. So now they don't, they're not seen as a victim for starters. And on top of it, even though uh, they are tough, even though they can defend themselves, again, they don't feel the need. And uh, I get constant stories about it. And, and uh, I've done it so long that, that uh, I'm blessed to be able to help these kids out and have those stories come back to me later in life. So we just listened to Wink. You've been training the kids now for a couple of weeks, help, helping assist with the kids' classes. What are you finding out about it? Like, is it, is it something you even want to do? I think that was one of my concerns with you. Was like, okay, you know, you're you should focus on yoga and your own training and jiu-jitsu and everything else. It's like, why do you want to mess with these kids? Yeah. You know, is it something you really want to do? And because you hadn't done it before, I wasn't sure. Um, so, like, how are you feeling? Yeah. Um, surprised, mostly. That's the big word. Um, I did not envision myself as a kids instructor. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a young guy. I practice jiu-jitsu. I, I, I travel a lot and do yoga. So the last thing for me was to teach kids but you guys asked me, and I, I knew Livy and, and Jake, and I saw the gym and figured that it'd be a good opportunity for me to just honestly get better at jiu-jitsu first. Because mm -hmm. I realized that if I teach it, it'll make me better. But uh, what I was surprised about, and I guess I shouldn't have been that surprised, but me not having kids, I didn't expect to have uh, too much of an emotional connection with the kids. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's like, it's unavoidable. Um, and it's just strange for being a, a young guy with no kids and not married. And But, uh, ha, you know, have five nieces. But seeing the girls come in or the kids come in every day and then smile or show me that they could do a handstand or, like, they do this in school or that in school. I'm like, oh, okay, I can see why people, you know, mm -hmm. love their kids and want to be parents. And this is, like, the cool part about it. And then the coolest part is, like, I can give them back to you guys and then yeah. leave. No, but um, seeing the kids and them, them being, like, attached to me and wanting to play with me and stuff like that. I never thought I was a kid person or anything like yeah. that, but that actually feels pretty good. And another big surprise was um, the ages of the kids. I, I I didn't think that we can have such young kids mm -hmm. who actually understand the movement. We have a little five-year-old, beautiful little girl, and before the uh, drill starts, she's on all fours and she's waiting for the wrestling moves to start, and she, and she moves Genevieve's hand just a little bit up because she needs to be high on her shoulder. And I just stop, and I'm like, "Wow, she's she's five, and, and here we are teaching um teaching them all these cool moves, and I just see a bunch of little cool ninjas around, and uh, it's cool hanging out with them. And I didn't expect to like get attached to them and all yeah. that. I want to be this cool guy, I'm a cool yoga guy, you know? I, but um, no, that's really cool. And then obviously my jujitsu is just I feel like in the last two months just boosted because I just remember so many small details that I have to really teach the kids mm -hmm. so when I'm rolling it's just second nature now with with, with a lot of guys so yeah. that's awesome that's a great part about it too which yeah. I kind of knew that was going to happen and that's um, yeah that's one reason why I wish I was able to watch more or actually or, or help out and even the wrestling classes like because that'd be all new to wrestling me you know, I, I'll be great. learning so much I like that a lot and I, I really like the way that John teaches and he's teaching them from the ground up you know um it's fun. it's funny you see me in there with the kids and I'm double legging these kids well not hard yeah. but I'm because I'm learning it too so I, I watch coach and I help the kids but I'm in there with the kids shooting for a yeah. single and doing stuff and it's just funny because it's a great way to learn even at 27 28 it's that's the best way to learn yeah. with kids because it's repetitive coach coach John is great mm -hmm. and he makes it very easy so I'm like I'm a cool wrestler now I'll shoot a double leg <laughs> 
so Jake training, Livy training, that's all been really cool. The other super cool thing is that their mom started training. You know, she'd been taking she'd been taking Olivia to uh, Jiu Jitsu for the last year. Uh, it's their special thing. At first, she thought I should be taking her because it was Jiu Jitsu was my thing. I was like, no. I was like, I don't want to go and watch kids class. I was like, I want to stay home and write or do whatever. It's like that's time for you guys to go. So she would go hang out with other moms. Um, and when we would come home, they'd want to show me moves, and Jen would always want to. She she would tell Libby what the moves were. She would remind her, and, and like she was remembering like everything. She it. was watching it all, very interested in it. And then she uh, they started. They decided they wanted to start training, so she wanted to start training. God damn it! I still have it on loud. Uh, it wasn't Jen who I wanted. Curve, huh? Learning curve. <laughs> I'm worried about missing picking up my kids, so come to some side. Um, so Jen, yeah, Jen started. So training. Jen started training. Yeah, so we decided that besides the youth center here, uh, we would have a female only class, uh, which is cool because a lot of females, especially ones that are starting out, may not be comfortable training with men. Big, sweaty, That's a big thing. might yeah. hurt them. It just be creepy. You don't know these guys, and then smell everything else. Everything, all dude. I, I rolled with a guy on Saturday. I was like, oh, like the whole We've gym kind of smelled. With someone and I was like, just, holy, yeah, dude, yeah. It, it was nasty. We've all had that experience for sure. So, and I, yeah, I probably smell all the time too. Yeah, it's all stuff. Um, but so they had their own class. Yeah. They just started. What? It's only been two weeks, I guess. Um, it's been a solid month. Or has it been three weeks? It's been a solid month. Uh, has it already? Yeah, okay. Like this week it's been a solid month for them. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they're loving it, and I've noticed. Like, I, I guessed what was going to happen. It was like you're going to go through everything that everyone else goes through when they start jujitsu. They love it, they and love it. and. Uh, yeah. You know, I think they were intimidated uh, a little bit, especially, you know, because and your girlfriend's doing it also. Yeah. Uh, yeah. John's wife. Uh, but everyone was on board. So whether or not some of them used to be athletes, some of them haven't done anything in a long time. Uh, you know, Jen's. Boy. No, we have a great crew. Um, once again, John is a head coach. I'm the assistant coach. Um, we have a great crew of women. Your wife, Jen, my girlfriend, Janine, um, his wife, Z. And the beauty of it is that they're all kind of just starting together. Mm-hmm. So there's no one who's really super advanced. There's no blue belts. They're all white belts. And it's uh, it's awesome. I, I'm i not sure if it's just because of jiu-jitsu. But and kinda, yoga. And yoga, too. Yeah, they're all, we're, all, the we're all doing yoga. We're all doing yoga. But uh, I was telling Mark, a funny thing is that me and my girlfriend have not argued this last month. And I think it's because any spare time we have, she's asking me to show her um, moves instead of I don't know, us bickering about whatever we used to bicker about. Mm. And maybe it's not just jujitsu and yoga. Maybe it's us just ha- having a good streak right now. But I don't know. I okay. kind of thought it was. And um, I see a big difference in her. And another, oh, go ahead. What's the difference that you see? Like, do you think, do you, can you tell, like, is she happier, you think? Do you, does I she think, enjoy it? I think she's happier because she's realizing that her body can actually do things, especially against, uh, like men, mm-hmm. men, um, they just learned triangle and even, she's tiny. She's five foot and I'm, you know, I'm not the biggest guy, but I'm, a, I'm not a small guy. And she was able to actually lock her triangle around and, mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, and lock it up on me. And I tapped and I told her it was legit because she squeezed really hard yeah. at first because she thought she really needed to. And I tapped and I told her, hey, <laughs> calm down. So she was really surprised. She starts laughing at me because mm-hmm. she realized that, oh, wow, she's powerful yeah. and she can actually do something. So that was cool. Um, and, you know, I actually had a reality check, too. Um, I'm a yoga instructor. You know, I preach, you know, let it go. And I preach, you know, dropping your ego and whatnot. But um, I had a reality check, too. Like, watching a man in her guard. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, um, I was taken back at first. But then, in that same split second, I thought about it and I realized, well, do you want a man in her guard teaching her moves? Or do you want a man in her guard, sorry to be blunt, but like raping her? Mm-hmm. And let's be honest, that's why women need to train jujitsu. There's right. a lot of great martial arts out there. But for women especially, like our your guard is let's call it let's call that the rape position. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what, you know, um so learning how to not get your yeah. back taken, learning how to have a strong guard, a strong triangle, strong arm bars, basics for I think self defense yeah. for sure for women. So once again, like I said, dropping my ego and being taken back for a second seeing this guy hugged up in my girlfriend's guard um but then again realize how she she must feel right when i roll with women or, or being a, a male yoga instructor and 
adjusting women or, mm. or you know so it was just a great lesson for me I think for her she feels more comfortable now with me rolling with women because she understands it more right. she understands it's nothing sexual like at a certain level this chick's gonna choke me out right. like blue belt chicks you know at least 10 planet chicks they're not playing yeah. around so they will choke you <laughs> there's mm. nothing sexual about it they'll get you um, so that was big that was big this week and like I said going back to us her I feel like she's happy she's realizing her body can reach certain potentials that she probably didn't think she could yeah and for us like instead of us arguing or i swear every little extra second we have she goes okay what was that transition and that's cool or what was this what was that so for me that's really cool and um, going back to the learning curve she didn't even want to do the first class right didn't want to do the first class and, and said, why was that she said she doesn't know enough to do jujitsu yet she wants to like look research it more yeah. or like learn yeah. or private lessons and i just told her i said okay but you know, just so you know, everyone's there. They're all white belts. Today's yeah. the first day for all you guys. It's like the first day of school. So, you know. You know and, yeah. I was going to say, when I started looking at the difference between jiu-jitsu guys and MMA guys, and which one of them would end up going into fighting, uh, that was one of the things we would see is, like, a lot of guys have a hard time going from a higher martial art, like being a higher belt, and then starting all over. Like, so if you're if you're a black belt in jiu-jitsu, you don't want to take that kickboxing class because you're a white belt. And you don't know what you're doing. And all these guys that you're, they respected you and looked up to you and for what all your skills over here, it's like, here, they're beating the hell out of you. And now it's flipped. And so that, that prevents a lot of guys from switching up. I'll be honest with you. You know, yoga is yeah. a big, I mean, I was that guy. You were that. Yeah. You, were, you, you were that yeah. guy. Oh, no. The, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I still am. Fuck but um, a lot, especially higher belts in jiu-jitsu, um, some of them take to yoga and they love yeah. it. You know, Master Hicks and Gracie did it. Others don't like being white belts at anything. Mm -hmm. um, so if they can't hit a half moon or if their down dog sucks, sometimes I see them shy away from class or not even come back to class. Yeah. And um, so, you know, if that's if 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 that's you, just take a dive. Uh, it's just like jujitsu. It's just like any other discipline. Yeah. You're gonna suck at first, but yoga is not about sucking. It's about healing your body. So. It's not sucky to heal your body. No. Just come in and get it done. And you're going to get better at it. Yeah. Dude, I'm, I'm doing so much more now. Like, the other day, I finally did a headstand to a handstand, which is what I like. I was like, and that's not even really practicing it. We don't train that often. But I was like, and a, just a little thing. But for me to be able to do that, I was like, that's cool. For so, anyone to unlock some potential yeah. in their body to see that they can really do something. Yeah. I, I get it every few months with yoga. I mm -hmm. hit a new pose that I didn't think I could hit. And I'm like, dang, I'm, I'm cool. Yeah, like, I yeah. feel good. And so... Yeah, I think the women are definitely getting that. They're yeah. all pumped up. Jen was, uh, Jen comes in af uh, after work. Oh, and yeah. And goes like this and flexes, and we see just yeah. bruises. Yeah. And she's proud of it. She had, a, uh, she had a big meeting yesterday. She was, had a long sleeve shirt on, and she asked how it looked. I was like, eh, okay. And she's like, well, I wanted to wear a short sleeve one, but all my bruises. I was like, show them off. I was like, it's cool. I was like, if nothing else, it's something cool to talk about. I was like, just don't tell them I did it. Because that's what she keeps threatening me with. Uh, looks like it's like, woman. Yeah. Um, but no, I swear that wasn't me. She just grips you um, guys, underhooks, overhooks. But it's funny, you know, she wants to she wants to go over stuff. We're going to, so pretty excited about this. We're doing the, the Tucson, Arizona Book Fest, Festival yeah, of Books. That's awesome. Uh, that's this Saturday and Sunday, doing it with Olivia. It's her first time getting a show off her book and signing it. Today she did a autograph copy to give to her teachers that's and like just super cool. Yeah. So that that's going to be that's going to be a lot of fun. So we're looking forward to that. We have to end up driving which kind of sucks, but whatever. We'll make the best of it. Um and we were going to leave Thursday, but Jen's like oh, we can't leave until after jiu-jitsu. I was like, "Really?" I was like, "I miss class whenever, but now because yeah. her." So I just I just laugh all the time. I think it's awesome. I think it's great. Uh, it's making I, her I happier. Love it. It's making it. her way happier, uh, and that's what it's all about, man. That is like we talked about that earlier, man. I yeah, just and how do you do feel watching you her? And because I feel, I feel like I feel great watching yeah. my girlfriend learn moves, and it's it's empowering. I think it's sexy yeah. too. It's awesome that she's she, she's empowered and she's loving yeah. it. So makes me think, man, I shouldn't yell at her so much. <laughs> she's gonna come up behind you when you're sleeping yeah. at night. Well, just no, that was one of the things. What you talked about with Janine landing the triangle on you. Um, a couple months ago, Jen tried to rear naked on me because I was letting Livy do it. I was like, put me asleep. I was like, just do it. I was like, I'll tap. Mm. You know, I was like, but try. And then Jen tried it and then she got it. And I tapped. She's like, you really tapped? I was like, yeah. Yes, you, it uh, works. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that just, that gave her so much. She's like, 
wow, I can really do that. I can really do this to a man that's bigger than me. And yeah, I was like, well, I think that's great. He's it's... not gonna let you take take the back like I did. Because I'm not just gonna give it to you. You have to fight for it. Yeah. But now but she's seen. Know. Now she's seen. Oh yeah, I do know these moves a little bit. But man, just fighting to get there, you know, and how hard that is, and I got to get rid of the anxiety and this and that, yeah. and calm everything down. So all awesome stuff. All good uh, stuff. You know what? We kind of went fast on this one because I have to go pick up my daughter. Um, she can be. She can wait a little bit. No, she likes it when I'm a little bit late, so that way she can next talk to episode her when your podcast partner <laughs> sucks. I'm just yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the next segment. Um, no, let's. Uh, are you gonna give him a but, short story? So what we're gonna do? Yeah. So next week, since this was supposed to be the chiropractic one, we still we have that footage. Have to listen to it. Hopefully, it sounds good and everything else. Um, that will be next week's episode. So we'll do the chiropractic one that week. Week after that, we have the Marines. Uh, we'll get Reese in here for that. Yes, uh, so that's going to be all great stuff. Um, and then, so we're just going to wrap up. Every every week, we're going to wrap up with uh, one of my short stories. Um, this one is from Twisted Reunion. Uh, every precious second. Um, this short story is... Uh, it, it don't, dude, it almost never saw the light of day. Um, it had been... I liked it, but it was kind of a slower story. Uh, it's about an old man who's been married, I forget how many years, like 60 years or more, and his wife is dying. So his sweetheart, Rose, uh, she's got maybe a couple days left to live, a week at most. And it's him, this old man, trying to slow down time to appreciate this every last second that he has with this woman. Um, you know, I often write about death, and this is one of, this is like a almost romantic, softer side. Uh, but what's cool? So I, but I almost didn't ever put it out. Uh, but this man, Don, uh, who's in a pretty similar situation with his wife of I think sixty years. I, I have the, wow. I, I have it messed up, but I think he's like eighty four. He's been married for a long time. Um, wife has Alzheimer's and everything else. He wrote to me just out of the blue to tell me how much he enjoyed Five Minutes Alone and Twenty Five Perfect Days, and that's always cool getting a message like that. So I wrote back to him and went back and forth. I found out a little bit about the situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I was like, no, I was like, I think I need to send you this story. I was like, for whatever reason, I was like, I think you need to see this. And then I felt so terrible after I sent it. I wanted to bring that, the story back. Um, I felt like a, a piece of shit. I was like, why did I just give this man whose wife is dying a story about a man whose wife is dying? Uh, but man, he wrote back to me and he said, he read it so many times and that I wrote it just for him. Like, wow. even though I didn't know him, That's I wrote huge. it for him and his wife and because it captured, he, he couldn't believe it, but it captured so many of the feelings that he's going through right now. And, um, so yeah, so I asked him to read it. So this is Dante, uh, narrating every precious second. Every precious second, a short story by Mark Tullius. The numbers on this stupid cell phone are so small that my finger punches the nine every time I shoot for the eight. My granddaughter tells me I should upgrade to one of those new smart gadgets. But it already takes me ten minutes to dial when there are actual buttons. This old hound dog's not learning any new tricks, especially on one of those virtual screens. Leave it alone, William. If it comes, it comes, Rose whispers. She pauses for a second to gather her breath. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It hurts her to talk. I turn up the volume on my hearing aid and ask if she wants some water. I want you to put down that phone. I made plans. Plus, Billy already pays for the shipping. It's not right if the package doesn't come. We shouldn't have involved her. This whole thing's wrong, and I feel torn up. I hold up the cell and squint over my glasses. I'll just be a minute. It's too early there. She's still in bed. I glance at the clock. It seems to run faster with every passing day. She's up, I say. Concentrate on pressing the eight. It's already noon. On the fourth ring, Billy answers with a yawn. Hi, Grandpa. Is everything okay? Everything's fine, sweetheart. You sure? Of course. The Afghan is slipping down Rose's thighs. 
I pulled it up to her waist. She's so frail you can hardly see her legs under the blanket. I asked our granddaughter, You weren't sleeping, were you? No. I wanted to catch you before your classes began. I need to be getting up anyway. My biochem final is 11. I was up pretty late last night studying for it. I completely forgot about the time difference. You're so far away. I don't even have to look to know Rose is rolling her eyes. I never remember the time difference. I wish I wasn't so far away, Grandpa. I'd leave today to see you guys, but Mom and Dad won't let me miss my exams. I told your father I'd tan his hide if he did. I'm still flying out next Thursday, right after my last test. For everyone, I say. You needn't to worry, Billy. You just focus on your test. We both know how much you love your grandma. But I want to see her. I want to say goodbye. Can I talk to her? Billy says, her voice quivering. Of course you can. I turn to Rose, her blue eyes shiny with tears. But I just had a quick question about the package. Didn't it arrive? Not yet. Do you think maybe they have the wrong address? I just wanted to make sure it's coming. Hold on. She reads off the correct address. I have the tracking number. I'll call them right now. Thank you, dear. I'd do it myself, but with all that button pushing, I'll end up getting instructions in Spanish or talking to some guy in India. Remember what I said, Grandpa. Only take one every four hours. That's plenty. Of course. I crane my neck to see out the kitchen window. No UPS truck. Just a snow-covered street. Thank you again for this, Billy. It's the least I can do. Let me put on your grandma. I love you. I love you too, dear. I shuffle around the table and hold the phone to Rose's ear. She jerks back like she's being attacked before realizing it's just my cell. Rose holds the phone to her ear and traps it in her neck and trembling hand to keep it there. They talk while I stare out the window. I check the grandfather clock in the living room. It's been in the family since I was a baby. Several minutes have slipped by. Rose says her goodbyes, and I fiddle to press end. She's biting her lower lip, so I tell her not to cry. I say, come on, what's the matter, beautiful? It's not right. We shouldn't be doing this to her. What if she gets caught? She'll get thrown out of school. No one's thrown out of anywhere. I've already played out the scenario a dozen times after Billy first told me about the pills. She went on and on about studies and chemical what-you-do's, but all I heard was, Time stops, Grandpa. She corrected herself and said, it actually just slows down perception. But I just kept thinking. Time stops. I stroke Rose's hand. Try not to be sad. Why don't I make you some tea? Rose flashes that smile I'll never forget. I'm not sad. Just worried. Well, stop. I look down at the phone. Let me make... One more call to, no, put it down, William. I just want to make certain that UPS has our correct address. You are like a dog with a bone. This is almost as bad as that decoder ring of yours, Captain Midnight. I hadn't thought of that cheap plastic ring in over 20 years. I waited six weeks for that. Standing out by the mailbox every single one of those days. I did, didn't I? I'd sent away for it on you know, one of those ads in the back of Boy's Life. You and your mother brought me in when it started snowing. We didn't want to see a dead kid out on the lawn. And your mother made that pecan pie. You were the only one who would eat it. 
Rose and I spent the entire summer fishing by the creek, walking through Drover's Canyon. We had our first kiss behind St. Gabriel's Church. I nearly passed out because my nose was all stuffed up from a cold, and I didn't want that kiss to ever end. After a sip of water, Rose looks at the wall. All those memories playing in her head. She says, Isn't this nice? I don't know if she's talking to me right now in this room, or me as a young man. The grandfather clock chimes. I look out the frosted window. Nothing. I'm calling them. This is ridiculous. Billy paid good money for it to arrive, and it hasn't. Calm down, William. I'm not going to let them rip her off like that. Please? She touches me, her hand shaking so much it tickles. I'm sorry, I tell her, but it gets me so mad. Darling, they're just pills. I can't have this conversation. I know where she's leading, to, so I stand. She asks where I'm going. I force a smile. I've got a surprise for you. Package or not, I can't let this ruin all my hard work. What surprise? Just some things. There's one for each of the next three nights. What are you up to, William? I no longer have to force the smile. I've been waiting months to show her. Suddenly I hear a ringing. I look at the phone in my hand. It's not that. So I peek around the corner at the landline on the wall. The little red light isn't flashing either. Did you hear something, William? No, I guess not. I wonder if my hearing is on a fritz again, just before a series of bangs come before the living room. I hurry to the window. A brown-clad man holding a small box is walking back toward the UPS truck idling at the curb. What's wrong? Rose asks as I try to hurry out of the kitchen. I concentrate on the floor in front of me, wishing my slippered feet would move faster. My labored breasts make my chest feel like it's burning. I reach the door and go to pull it open, but the deadbolt and the security chain are fastened. My fingers tear at the chain, slip it free. I twist the lock and open the door as a blast of cold air knocks the delivery slip from the screen door. The yellow scrap of paper blows off the porch and towards the truck, where the delivery man is already behind the wheel. I'm here! Stop! I wave my hand and nearly slide off the icy porch. The snow seeps through my slippers. The truck pulls away from the curb as I hobble down the slick stairs, gripping the handrail. Another gust of wind picks up the small slip and carries it into Peterson's bushes across the street. I prepare to step off the curb when the UPS truck circles back. I'd been in such a panic, I hadn't realized it had to make a U-turn at the end of the cul-de-sac. The delivery man pulls right up next to me. I've waved once more because I can hardly breathe. He asks, Mr. Hanran? I gulp and nod. The delivery man hops down from the truck with a small package in his hand. It's freezing out here. Let's get you inside. The man offers his outstretched arm, and as much as it makes me feel like a damn fool, I take it. It's like we're going to the prom. I mumble a thank you and try to keep pace as he helps me up the walkway and the stairs. By the time we make it onto the porch, and into the house. My slippers are completely soaked. I kick them off and reach for the package, but the young man is holding out the electronic pad. Sign here first, please. My arthritic pink frozen fingers can't even pick up the pen. I want to scream, cry, and punch the guy in his face. I guess my frustration shows because he tells me it's okay hands me the box, and scribbles a name on the pad. This might actually come in handy, should the authorities ever track this down. Uh, no, officer, I never signed for drugs. 
Sorry about you having to chase me down, the deliver man says. You get warm and have a great day. With the box in my hands, I suddenly no longer cold or anxious. You've made an old man's day. Thank you. I close the door, head over to the hutch, grab my wooden box of secrets, and carry everything to the kitchen. Rose is still sitting in her chair, shaking. At first I think it's another stroke, but then realize she's freezing. I left the door wide open, chasing down the delivery man. The entire house has turned into an icebox. I set both boxes on the table and hurry over to the hallway closet. My feet are still wet. I find her favorite red quilt on the top shelf, pull it down, walk back, and wrap it around her shoulders. I'm sorry, honey. I place a gentle kiss on her forehead. Is that better? She eyes the box I'm tapping. Open it for me? Her smile is back, warmer than a radiator. In a minute, let's just make sure this is okay. I scrape my thumbnail on the UPS package. The tape is stronger than it looks. After a few attempts, I set the box down, angry. I can't do the simplest things. Rose, always prepared, passes a butter knife across the table. It takes half a dozen tries, but I carve through and find a bottle of extra strength Advil. Advil? Rose says. All this for Advil? I struggle with the cap and dig out the cotton ball, dump the blue pills into my hand. Billy couldn't very well put a label with the real name on it, could she? I don't know. We never took drugs before. Not once. You smoked a joint at Barbara Wilcox's Christmas party. That was 40 years ago. These are fine, Rose. I slide the pills back into the bottle. They're no different than your heart medicine. Then why are they illegal? Darling, trust me on this. We don't have much time left together. These pills will help us enjoy every precious second. Billy said they'll intensify our perceptions and feelings. That sounds terrifying. It does not. One minute is going to feel like an hour. One hour will feel like a day. Something splashes against the back of my hand. I realize it's a tear. And that's exactly what I need right now. Rose bites the inside of her cheek like she always does when she's about to give me an earful. Only this time she says, You really sure about this? Pause the day. Oh, Lord, I hope you're right. I thank her and open the wooden box, take out the plastic case with a DVD inside it. This is a slideshow. Pictures of our friends, families, all of our memories, vacations, weddings, anniversaries, Billy's birth, everything you can imagine. All this on a disc? Oh, honey, that's so thoughtful. We'll watch this one tomorrow. I then pull another DVD from the box. Rose asks what's on it. I say, this one is all videos. It's for the third night. Sandra, Jimmy, Elaine, and Frankie helped me edit it. I used to hate whenever they would get out those recorders, but now I'm glad they did. Her faded blue eyes sparkle. Third night? Why not tonight? No, tonight we have this. I pull out the final plastic case. This is a recording of all our favorite songs. I motion toward the door to our enclosed back porch. We'll have a nice evening out there, listening to it as the sun sets. I don't want to wait. Well, I'm afraid that's just too bad. I've got to, some setting up to do, and it's about time for your nap. Oh, you sure know how to spoil a treat.
she pretends to be upset, her grin giving her away, like always. I swear, the woman would be the world's worst spy. I close the box, get her from the table, and offer my hand. Let's get you rested. You're all mine tonight. I help her to her feet. You devil. You've never changed. And you never need to. Rose pats my hand. We make it a few steps before she grimaces, quickly covering it with a smile. I start to ask if she's all right, if she wants to stop, but she hushes me as we head into the bedroom. The grandfather clock strikes five o'clock just as I finish setting up the back porch. The CD player is on the coffee table next to the pitcher of sweet tea along with two glasses. There are two napkins, each with two blue pills. I turn the thermostat up to a toasty 78, a nice contrast to the winter wonderland on the other side of the plate glass window. The entire back acre is covered with virgin snow, the sun almost ready to drop behind it. I take one last look, making sure I haven't missed anything then head to the bedroom. When I open the door, I see Rose is still in bed. Any other night, and I'd let her sleep. Rose, dear, I whisper softly, then again, a little louder. Her good hand is resting over her heart. She's not sleeping. I ask if she's okay. Just so tired. I know, sweetheart, but do you think you could get up? She gives a weak nod, and I help her to her feet. Take your time, I tell her, but I'm practically pulling her out the door. She says, someone's got ants in his pants. I'm wearing a robe. Oh, you think you're so cute? I don't respond. Just help her cross through the kitchen. Now. Let's have ourselves a nice time. Two minutes later, Rose is in her chair and I'm pouring her a glass of tea. No wonder we don't come out here much, she says. The trip from the bedroom clearly exhausted her. I feel like we walked to Vermont. I hand her the glass. It's nice, though, isn't it? Her blue eyes seem to gain color as she looks out the window. It is, dear. It really is. Thank you. I pluck two pills off her napkin and hold them in my open palm. Are you ready? Didn't she say only one each? If one is good, two is better. Rose looks at the pills. I worry she's going to back out, but she opens her mouth and sticks out her tongue. Gently, I place them. Two swallows of tea, and they're gone. Here's to us, I say. I pop mine in and wash them down with a swig. Then I push the play button, and from you, I'll never part, starts. Rose sighs. Our wedding song. I start to sit when I realize I've forgotten the final touch. I head up the three stairs into the kitchen. A sharp twinge of pain shoots down my leg. My sciatic is acting up. Doc would tell me to rest, that I've overdone it, but I can't think about the pain. Where are you going? Rose asks. The sun is setting and our song's on. Won't be a minute. I hurry around the table and reach my hand into the little sliver of spaces between the cabinets and the top of the icebox, a single white rose. I picked it up from the grocery store yesterday. Had to sneak it in while Rose was napping. It's a little dusty. I blow on it and gently wipe it with my finger. The soft music floats in from the porch, and I can't wait to get back to my wife. I shuffle towards the back porch with the rose in one hand, and the other running along the wall to steady myself. 
It's so smooth and cool to the touch. I look over and see the rose, a streaming trail of petals carving through the air. The wedding song stops, snaps me out of this trance. I realize I've been sliding back and forth across the floor in rhythm to the music. The next song begins, gone but not forgotten. I stare out the window onto the porch, mesmerized by the sunset. The purple strip of sky between the snow and the clouds reminds me of the nights that Rose and I snuggled on the couch, holding each other as darkness descended. I reach the porch and hold on to the handrail for support, and there's my wife. This woman, so full of love, so full of kindness, that's cared for me since we were children. Her soft cheeks, the deep smile lines showing anyone and everyone how she has spent her life, always laughing, always thankful for what's in front of her. Rose turns her head, those blue eyes piercing through me as I make my way down the stairs. That look melts my heart. Tears are sliding down my cheeks, in and out of my wrinkles. I have to explain to her before she goes that she's made my life worth living. Each silver hair on her head sways back and forth. They're soft and fine like a baby's. I want to caress them and assure her that everything is going to be okay. I'm not going to let her go. I'm going to keep her here with me forever. The world starts to tilt. I'm falling. My foot catches on a step, my weight tumbling forward. I tried to bring my other leg underneath me to catch myself, but it's too late. Rose screams. This melodious roar as my right wrist snaps against the floor, the crackling echoing in my ears. I can't look away from her as the rest of my body seems to hover in midair. Rose pushes off the chair, her long sleeves barely rippling. My hip crunches into a thousand shards, a terrific pain. Waves of agony wash through me when my head cracks off the carpeted concrete. My fragile skin splits, a warmth slowly spreading along my face as Rose falls back into the chair. My fingers crawl along the fibers, trying to push myself off the ground, but my hip feels like slivers of glass digging into my flesh. I can only raise my head an inch, warm blood dripping down my lips. Rose clutches her chest. Her scream softens with the song as the sun slowly dips beneath the horizon. The last streams of light slide down her body, leaving her once bright blue eyes forever sparkling in the dark.